Amen. It's such a it's such a wonderful thing just to sit in the presence of family. I was just thanking God for family. This is like the yes. this is such a great family. This is a lighthouse family and all of our folks, if you're visiting with us tonight, we're just so grateful for you. We're having a good time. It's like a family reunion. I hate going home. So um, I won't do that to you tonight, but um, we are going to look at the word of God. <clears throat> Recent, uh, a, a little while ago when I was studying for this, for this message, I remembered a story that I had read, and I couldn't find the story, but the story that actually I read was that there was a woman that turned up at Whole Foods on Montana just a few blocks away, and apparently she had been living as a slave in a house like north of Montana. And if you know this area, anywhere that way is really wealthy. Actually, everywhere now, but like, you know, back when, you know, in, there was a time when there was a dividing line, and and she walked into a place and she was basically like, I'm trying to escape. I've been here for years, you know, uh, as a slave. And I, and I was looking for that story. And, and you might well know that this is a big deal in our, in our society today, that there's a lot of people that are in our world today, maybe rubbing shoulders with. And I read stories about kids that are on buses, you know, that are, that are, that are just riding the bus and they're, they're actually a slave. And, and um, I read a story about a, a woman, um, her name is Sh I don't know if her name's pronounced right, Shamaya. She was smuggled into the United States at 10 years old and lived as a slave for four or five years until a neighbor realized something was wrong. Turned out she was living in the garage, on, you know, living like in a windowless garage on an old mattress, washing her clothes in a bucket. And um, they, they found out the child services came and they, and they rescued her. And I was reading her story. She was, from, she was Egyptian. The family was from Egypt. And her dad had sold her into slavery when she was eight years old for $30 a month. And they called her parents when they captured her, and they, or when they, when they rescued her, I should say, and um, found out she'd never been to a doctor. She'd never been to a dentist. She, she didn't know how to speak English. And uh, they called her, when she spoke to her father, they understood through an interpreter that her father said, get away from there, go back to your, your master. Like, like, run away from the police, get away, go back to your master, because this is the money that he's receiving. And she never went home, and so she's all by herself at 13 years old, rescued. And years went by, you know, that happened years ago, and in, um, in just this in the article I read just recently, she became a citizen. And what she said was, and this is what really struck me, because it's, you know, it's heartbreaking you know, to be around kids all the time. She has never seen her family since, but what her dream is, is to become a federal agent to be able to crack down on human trafficking and free the enslaved. And it's just a mind-blowing that here's someone who has experienced so much trauma and so much suffering, and a little girl to have to go through all of that. And when she's free, she says, I want to I work. I want to put myself back into service to be able to free those who are lost. And she's, you know, the, the agent that worked with her she said she's gone literally through a living hell, and now she wants to give back. She's there to give other people courage. The reason why I tell that story is because the Bible talks a lot about slavery, and it talks a lot about God's people, people that have come to Jesus and people that have known Jesus that are battling this spirit of slavery. And I, and I, don't, I don't even pretend to know what this is like, and I just thank God that I never had to go through anything like this. But there is a, a fact today that there are people that are living in bondage, and perhaps more than any time in human history, there are more people that are living in actual slavery. But I will say beyond that, that there are people, whether you are free, living in the United States of America, in a free country, that you are in fact living in slavery. Because slavery is more than just a situation that you would live in. And I've read the stories of, you know, concentration camp survivors who said they could take my body, but they can never capture my mind, who are living more free than more, most people that are living in this world. But God wants to set the captive free. Jesus came to set the captives free. God wants to set you free tonight. He wants to set me free. And he wants to help us that we would be used by him to be able to set people free. Exodus 6 the Bible says, and this is the verse that struck me when I read it, 
They're really, uh, I couldn't get past it. I read it in March and it stuck with me since. The Bible says in verse five, moreover, I have heard the groaning of the people of Israel whom the Egyptians hold as slaves. And I have remembered my covenant. Say therefore to the people of Israel, I am the Lord and I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians and I will deliver you from slavery to them. And I will redeem you with an outstretched arm with great acts of judgment. I will take you to be my people and I will be your God and you will know that I am the Lord your God who has brought you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. I will bring you into the land that I swore to Abraham, to Isaac, to Jacob. I will give it to you for a possession for I am the Lord. I mean, that is so powerful. You feeling me? But the last verse struck me. Moses spoke this good news to the people. Can you imagine? From light, I mean, from darkness into light, from slavery into freedom, from nothing into great possession, from nothing to real estate. I mean, come on. But they did not listen to Moses because of their broken spirit and harsh slavery. One thing that I've realized talking to people and being a pastor is there are people that are slaves to the grind. And I want to look at that first of all. You know, slavery in our text is somebody. You know, it's interesting. The Lord says, I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. The Egyptians were holding them as slaves. And so defining slavery into our text, this is broken spirit. That means a crushed spirit, that they are crushed. They are restricted Under harsh slavery, something else, someone else is holding them and controlling their time, controlling their efforts, their energy. And the Bible says, according to our text, we can't, won't hear God because of a broken spirit in harsh slavery. What is that? You know, what is enslaving you? You're busy, you're rushing, out of control, never enough time, stress. Did you just get a notification? You know, it's funny, the first time that noise went, a lot of people checked their phones. You know, broken spirit means you can't breathe. You can't breathe. It means that you're stuck. You know, it's interesting, I was wearing an Apple Watch for a while, and you know, it tells you to stand up, it also tells you to breathe. I got so mad at that, I took off my Apple Watch. I can't wear it anymore. I only wear it when I want to go surfing. Because I can't, I can't stand it. Don't tell me when to breathe. I want to breathe when I want to breathe. You're not in control of my breathing. You're not in control of my standing up. Don't, do not burden me with that stress. Harsh slavery is when something else or someone else is controlling you. Some of you are being controlled by these notifications because you have been conditioned to be controlled. You are under harsh slavery. I, one of my pet peeves, I, I just confess, is when you're talking to somebody... And they're like, yeah, 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 yeah. No, I'm listening. Really, I'm listening. Why do you have to tell me that? Because you're not listening. (laughs) It really bothers me until I get caught doing it. (laughs) You know, slavery is harsh. It's, It's manipulating your time. It's what you feel like you're missing out on. It's right now what you're feeling like you're missing. It's what, you, what bothers you. It's what you, when you're on your mind, when you're doing something, it's also on your mind. You know what bothers me? On a beautiful day and I'm at work and I look out the window, the wind is offshore, it's a sunny day and I know they're surfing. It annoys me. It drives me. I gotta get everything done. I gotta get everything done. I gotta get to the beach. I gotta get now. I used to miss one day surfing and get concerned that I was missing my edge. I was under bondage. Harsh slavery. I want, to look at, I want you to look at a couple pictures here before I tell them to turn off the noises because I conspired that noise. There's a couple pictures of people that are reading their texts. I want you to look at this. Okay. Standing up straight, your head weighs about 10 pounds, maybe a little bit more. When you start to look at your notifications, your head begins to weigh 27 pounds. By the person on the end, which is nowhere near what I see most of us do when we look at our text. You see that? Your head weighs up to 60 pounds. And then you wonder why you have a a bad back. And you always need your shoulders rubbed. And your neck's always out of line. You know, there was a a little girl. She was 16 years old. She was admitted to the hospital. You guys can turn it off. because It's starting to get me a little bit. 
Thank you so much. I love our sound team. They're so good. They, lo they love it when we do something different, yeah. There was a girl, she was 16. Her symptoms were a headache, vertigo, ataxia, I don't know what that means, dizziness, acute neck pain, a history of headaches. And they examined her, nothing was wrong. They couldn't figure out what was wrong with her. And they realized that her, next, her neck had a problem, and there's this syndrome called Tex neck. Have you heard of it? All the pros know it. She was a high school student, and she described a daily routine of six hours a day of commitment to study. It was reevaluated by the orthopedist, and the, and the, uh, the uh, I don't even know the name of that person. But what they did, that her prescription was, she could not bend her neck forward, and she had to do studies and, and uh, training and physical therapy for her neck. She could not watch her touchscreen devices for two hours a day, or uh, for anything over two hours a day, which was a big sacrifice for her. And it began to heal her, and it found out that there's this syndrome that's going around. It's called Tex Neck. And I wrote this before Pastor Steve's message, and I won't say he covered a lot of good ground, and I'm not going to go into that, but let me just ask you, what enslaves you today? Because the Bible says you won't hear from God because there's something enslaving you. But let's go deeper. What about guilt? What about the shame that you've, that you've gone through, the mistakes that you've made? What about the offenses that everybody has offended you and people have offended you and perhaps I've offended you and the scars, perhaps the expectations, the expectations of this world of what you should have been. You know, I got saved because I carried the slavery of expectations upon my life. When I was 16 and I remember a word from God, a prophet spoke to me and he began to tell me the expectations that I felt that they weren't from God and that God loved loved me and I felt like I can't believe it because I, I blew the expectations. I let everybody down. I carried the shame and the guilt, the anger and the frustration. He said, you know, God loves you and he has a plan for your life and he forgives you. And it shook me because I was carrying the slavery. I was enslaved by my fear. Society, you know, what about cool or not cool? Whatever cool means today, you know, I think I've been lost. Fast, it's quickly outrunning me. When my kids ask me, like, what's cool? I'm like, I don't know, guys. My whole theory is just try not to, like, rock the boat too hard so you don't get embarrassed, right? It's going fast. And the fear of getting behind, the fear of failure, the fear of rejection, the fear of loss, the fear of not having enough. I could go on and on, but these are things that enslave us. You know, sometimes I try to talk to my kids and I give them suggestions. And I say, hey, why don't you try X, Y, Z? And they look at me like... That's not going to work, Dad. My world, my logic, my thoughts, they don't work. My way of thinking, it's trapped. I'm trapped in what I think. What I think is I need another cup of coffee. <laughs> One time I tried to uh, fast coffee, and it was, I did all right. But then I fasted sugar, and I couldn't come out of the room for like, like 48 hours. The window was blind because my head hurt so bad enslaved. What are you enslaved to? Because God wanted to give them freedom, possessions, real estate. That means something in Santa Monica. He wants to speak to them. He says, I will be your God and you'll be my people. And I've heard people say, I don't hear from God. And after reading that verse, the response could be, perhaps something enslaves you. Perhaps Pharaoh and the taskmasters are whipping so hard that you can't get a moment, you can't take a breath to hear God's voice that wants to set you free. The Bible says that people couldn't hear God because they were too busy and they couldn't breathe. As Pharaoh said, hey, God's, he heard God speak. He's like, no, 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 get back to work. Get back to work. Get back to work. Get back to what you think is important. Get back to what you think is so valuable. Get back to what you think is so, so precious to your time. You're going to fall off the leaderboard. Slavery kept them from hearing God. Slavery is when someone else controls us. Slavery is when we aren't in control. Slavery is when we can't stop and we can't Sabbath. We can't take a breath. We can't receive the Holy Spirit. You know, according to our text... Slavery 
is not only physical, and there is slavery that has, has plagued human history, and what a curse since the very beginning. But every human being has the capacity to be enslaved in their mind. Biblically, we find the root of slavery in the children of Israel within a mindset that slavery in many ways begins in the mind. You know, the children of Israel went to Egypt because they wanted a place of safety. They wanted a place of provision. They went to Egypt with, with Joseph because Joseph was going to take care of them and he was going to protect them and he was going to provide for them and he was going to give them money and he was going to give them support and give them land and crops and a job. And so they went there for covering, but because of their dependence, they put them in a position to be enslaved. God was setting them free in our text, but they couldn't hear because of their slavery. Their mind couldn't get off their problems, couldn't get off their, their needs and, and the work. You know, there are some people here that won't hear from God or can't hear from God because something else or someone else has you. You know, I want to look at freedom of choice. You know, we hear that a lot in our society. You know, freedom of choice is such a weird conflict. It's such a weird statement because it's so, like, sarcastic. It's ironic because it's freedom of choice, but the baby never even gets to talk. So it's not freedom of, it's not like a voice. It's like somebody's voice is more important than somebody else's voice. You know, if you ask the baby, if you're, you know, if, if your mom lets you live, will you like, will you like bless your mom for the rest of your life? Yes! You know, when I talk to the kids at our school, when I ask, like, who blesses you the most in their life, guess what the first word that comes out of their mouth is? Mom. Who loves you? Mom. What about dad? Dad, too. Yeah, dad. What about Pastor Josh? Pastor Josh, you know, can I have a snack shack? But it's always mom. And you think about that. Like, that's the one person. Like, that's the baby. The babies love their moms. And yet slavery is this mindset. You know, there's, you know, the Bible says, and this is what shook me here as well in this text, is that God never called his people slaves. He never said, you're slaves. He said, the Egyptians hold them as slaves. And Pharaoh has them in slavery. God doesn't ever, never, ever, ever thinks of you as a slave. The only person that thinks of us as a slave is us. So what calls us? What enslaves us? You know, the Bible says there's a few things that enslaves God's people as we look through the word of God is one thing that has the possibility, and, and I want to say this, it is possible that pride enslaves us. Because already some of us have said, I'm definitely not enslaved. There's nothing that has me. You know, 10 out of 12 spies trusted their own point of view. Two of them said, God said we should have it. Those guys are big, but like, there's really good food there, like a honey and there's like a great land. But like two, only two of them actually believed God. Ten of them trusted themselves. Do the math. One out of six. Mathematicians, what percentage is that? 16%. Only 16% of you. <laughs> but we're, we're not on this criteria here. Even though they were slaves, their whole life, they were slaves. They grew up in slavery. Their dads were slavery. Their grandparents were slavery. They were slaves. Slavery doesn't make you humble. Just because you've been humbled doesn't make you humble. Deuteronomy tells us the opposite. The Bible says that God needed 40 years to bring humility into their life. Deuteronomy 8, 2, and you shall remember the whole way that the Lord your God has led you these 40 years in the wilderness that he might humble you. 40 years in the wilderness to humble you, testing you to know what was in your heart, whether you would keep his commandment or not. And he humbled you and let you hunger and fed you with manna that you did not know. Verse 5, know in your heart as a man disciplines his son, the Lord your God disciplines you. Another thing that enslaves us is our affections. What enslaves you today is our affection. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 11, we have spoken freely to you, Corinthians. Our heart is wide open. You are not restricted by us, but you are restricted in your own affections. 
And when people get mad and frustrated and feel like they're trapped and in bondage, the Bible makes it clear that our own affections have enslaved us. I want this, and I don't have it, so I'm mad at you. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not happy. Like, I think you're happy, even though you might not be happy, but I think you're happy. I'm not happy like you. So I need to take what you have. I need to make your life my life. I need to change this way, the world, you know, affections. This affection here, this is that harsh bondage, restriction, cramped. The Bible says restriction, in, you're restricted by your own affections. It means cramped, constrained, compressed, kept in a tight place, trapped. It's what you're defensive about. When your spouse, you know, that's why one of the reasons to get married is you find out what you really have affections for. When your spouse, when you ask your spouse, like, they say, you know, you defend that a lot. You really get defensive on that issue. You ever have that conversation? Sounds like Bailey and Annie had that conversation. <laughs> I really appreciate your honesty, Bailey, because that's all of us. <laughs> he was reading our mail. We're like, I'm thankful that he put himself on blast so that we could laugh, right? But that's our issues. <laughs> But, you know, it's what you feel strongly about. Affections are like our emotions, our compassion, our gut, what we feel passionate about, what we have compassion about. Our emotions have us trapped, keeping us cramped. What are we most affectionate about? What are you most affectionate about? It's like, don't make me miss church or I will hate you. <laughs> don't make me miss prayer or we're going to have issues. Don't you go there. You better not mess with my Bible reading time. No, it's like, who took, who took all the creamer? <laughs> oh, my goodness. Let's go. Wait, there was ice cream in the fridge, and now there's not. Heads are going to roll. Your affections. I feel like one of my problems in my affections is like, I don't like when somebody messes with my, with my free time. Like I build my schedule so that I can have free time. But if you mess with my free time, man, it's like all of a sudden there's like something inside of me that starts glitching, you know, it's like, ah, you know, and I start thinking green, you know, I want to be the, the Hulk, like, get out of my way. You know, I, I have to, I'm going to give you a case study with me because I don't want to talk about you. I'm going to talk about, you know. Last Sunday, Pastor Rob made me do the saints cheer in front of the church. And I've, I've, I've healed. But it was a really fresh, open wound. And, you know, I was, like, frustrated. Let me just say this. Um, one of our school parents said, I could tell that you didn't really want to listen to your dad. And then I got home, and my, my kids were like, Dad, man, like, you were being foolish. You were being rebellious. <laughs> And I'm like, no. And Kathy looked at me and was like, no, no, you were, being, you were. So let me give you a little bit of explanation about why I have a deep-seated affection. I grew up as a pastor's kid. As if that, you know, I remember going to Kim Pensinger's church a long time ago. And we were in the middle of service. And he pointed at me when I was a kid. He says, Josh, get up here and give a testimony. Some of you would be offended and hold a grudge against me like, like I remember that moment to this day. My dad is embarrassing me. I was like a teenager, you know, like, oh, and I'm like, oh, dad, do I have to? And then I remember it happened again in Tucson. It's like, yeah, now you're feeling me. Embarrassment, grrr. It's a pride issue, you know? He said, when he called me up, he's like, I don't want to do the cheer. That cheer is to like, for victory, for winning, and we're, we're suffering by loss. I don't want to. I don't think anybody here wants to give the saints cheer on Sunday morning. The night, like less than 12 hours ago, we lost. I hate losing. Losing hurts. It's, it's bad. <laughs> so I'm a Christian, so I don't have to lose. <laughs> don't you see I was enslaved by my emotions? I don't agree at all. My pride said, no, you're not going to do it. And then Wednesday night when he showed that video again, I was in my seat next to my wife. And I started, when he showed that video, he's like, oh, he's going to ask me to do it again. I said, no, no. And she could hear me. I was, I was like, no, dad. Don't make me do it. Don't make me do it. 
And my wife looked over at me. He who finds a wife finds a good thing and obtains favor from the Lord. And she says, submit. (laughs) That was it right there, baby. I was enslaved and she broke me out of slavery right there. She gave me the word of life. She's like, you're going to have to submit to your pastor. You're going to have to submit to your dad. And then he didn't make me do it. Praise the Lord. (laughs) Freedom isn't free. And Bible says they became prideful during slavery and it made them prideful. Prideful is possible in slavery. You can be enslaved and get really, really prideful because pride is when you trust your own thinking. And you know what? You're enslaved by whatever it might be, whatever. You know, one of the biggest enslavements, and, I, and you know, I can see how social media can be used for the gospel, but I can see the ideal and the image of what is so good out there and what is so, in the, in the life that somebody else is living, that you think they're living, how that enslaves people. And they're like, I want that life. I don't blame you. Like, I have a surf resort. Like, you know, I, I have like three things I look at on Instagram, and one of them is a surf resort. And I look at that, man, and I go, oh, I just want to go there. And I just watch Perfect Waves and guys surfing. He's like, man, that is so beautiful. I want to go there. And I'm like, who is it? And I begin thinking there's like a family that's surfing there, and they're all getting good waves. I'm like, who is that family? What do they do? What does that dad do for a living? You guys got me? Slippery slope right there. Enslaved by my affections. I just need to turn it off. Shut that thing down. I don't want to look. You know, freedom actually reveals what's in your heart. You know, I remember when I got my driver's license, I was free. I was able to drive to school, drive to church, do errands for my mom and dad, pick up the kids from carpool, and then drive them there and drive them that. And then, (laughs) can you go to the market for me, Josh? Oh, I need you to take a box there. I need you to pick up this person. I need you to do that. But then I also used my freedom to go to parties and do what was wrong and to break the rules, to sin, to abuse my freedom. Because it doesn't make you now no longer a slave on the inside just because you have freedom on the outside. It's it's possible to enslave wicked and prideful and rebellious and carnal and be a slave. Three days after the Red Sea, the Bible says, all the congregation, Exodus 16.1, all the congregation of Israel came to the wilderness of Sin between Elam and Sinai on that 15th day of the second month after they had departed from the land of Egypt and the whole congregation of the people of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. I wish that we had died in the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt when we sat by the meat pots and ate bread to the full. You know, meat can cause you to, cause you to really stop. Good barbecue, man. Some of you are enslaved by meat. Just can't say no. It speaks to you. Those Traegers, man, I'm enslaved by my lust for a Traeger. You guys know what that is? It's those smoker grills. I want one of those those grills so bad. I'm enslaved, but I have to say no. Most of you have no idea what I just said. And the rabble among them had a strong craving, and they said, oh, that we had meat to eat. We remember the fish in Egypt that cost nothing, the cucumbers, the melons, the leeks, and the onions, and the garlic. Don't you guys remember that you were slaves like a month ago? Three days ago, God separated the Red Sea, but immediately their slavery is already craving what they left behind. The slave was still inside of them. They couldn't be set free. It's like almost like they wanted to be slaves just so they could have the the meat that they wanted. Because freedom was tough. The unpopular choice is that you're going to have to choose. And I appreciate your patience here, but you're going to have to choose. The Bible says in Joshua 24, 15, Pastor Rob uses verse. This is one of my favorite verses. Choose you this day whom you're going to serve. And I'm going to paraphrase. The gods of everybody everywhere else or the Lord. You're going to have to choose whom you're going to serve. Every day, you're going to have to make a choice. Every single day, you're going to have to make a choice forever. You're going to have to choose whom you're going to serve. And freedom requires us to serve. The Bible doesn't say you can serve the Lord, you can serve idols, or you can just be neutral and do nothing. We want that option, right? I just want to be free. I want to live in this freedom. Well, freedom isn't free. You're going to have to choose. You know, that's one of the problems that I have 
with our politics, the politics situation, is that we want freedom, but we don't want to deal with our pride and our affections. You know, our leaders reflect the people. And we're upset in California, but that's because for a long time we haven't reigned in our affections and we haven't cared, we haven't been willing to do the work. You know, I got a letter from the IRS. You may be eligible for $1,500 from all the difficulties for last year. You guys don't get that. For all the money that you lost. And I was like, well, what about like the people that we lost? What about the closing of churches? What about the jobs that were lost? That won't even cover a one-bedroom apartment for one month in Santa Monica. And that's going to somehow put a Band-Aid on the problem? Like, no, don't, don't, I'm not going to sell out to you. Don't give me that letter. You're like, made me mad, that letter. Like, what do you think I am? You think I'm going to you know, buy me out? No. I'm free. I paid my taxes so that people could go poop in the alley. <laughs> Makes me mad. And there's a billion, three billion masks under SMC stands, just in case we need to wear them again. Doesn't that make you mad a little bit? But I'm going to give you $1,500 so you can feel better. No. I'm not a slave. You're not going to buy me off. Government support is a pharaoh. Don't give in. So not voting is choosing to be enslaved. But even if you say, I just don't care about all that, pharaoh will come after you for more. You know, we want doctors and nurses and medicines to cure our diseases, but we are unwilling to make healthy diet and exercise choices. <laughs> fix me, fix me, fix me. But you're enslaved because you can't say no to sugar. Like me, 48 hours in a dark room, rubbing my head because it hurts so bad. We get mad that we get controlled, but we're not controlling ourselves. That's all I want to say. We get mad when people want to control us and exert something on us, but we have to control our, there's a, there's a choice that you have to make. Choose your, who you're going to serve. Entertainment is a pharaoh. You might miss that series. You might miss that game. Sports entertainment is a pharaoh. What does it do? It takes our time, our energy, our emotions, and our passion. I got depressed when the Dodgers lost. I have to confess. And I had this, this sorrow, but then there was like this silver lining that I don't have to wrestle with that slavery during harvesters. Yeah. <laughs> I'm so grateful that I don't have to worry about the World Series right now. I can have a single-minded focus on the Word of God. My emotions. It requires our schedule. It requires our sacrifices. It requires our goals. All of these are choices, our dreams. It keeps us from our kids. It keeps us from our marriages. No one ever said, when I get to my deathbed, I want, I want to be remembered for never missing an NFL game and never missing the highlights. Nobody ever said in their deathbed that I, I, I want to boast that I never missed an, a Netflix series. I saw and liked or didn't like every Instagram post that came into my feed. I never missed a tweet or a new song dropped from anyone. Nobody ever said that. When I get to the finish line, I want it to be said I was a pillar in the house of God. That I served the Lord, that I served his people, that I was faithful to my wife. And I was there for my kids and I live free. And that's a choice we have to make every day. And you know what? It doesn't go away. And this is what I thought about this. And I appreciate your, your patience here. But you know what doesn't go away? You know, the slavery spirit does never goes away. Bible says that they got to the Mount Sinai, Moses up on the mountain, and he comes down, and these are the freed slaves. They've been in the wilderness. God's taken them to the promised land. He comes down the mountain, and the Bible says in Exodus 32, 25, Moses saw the people had broken loose. It's like, I always think of foot loose. The people were running wild. They were running wild. That's what it means. That's like the meaning of broken loose. They're running around wild like crazy, like, we're free, we're free, we don't know what to do. Let's go crazy. Let's worship an idol. Yay! Let's crazy. Let's do crazy things. Because they don't know what to do. They're like, they've been told what to do their whole life. You know, slave mentality. 
was still there. They were out of control. They couldn't discipline themselves. And then you see it go on in 1 Samuel 8. The Bible says that they began to crave and cry out for a king. The Bible says they came to Samuel like, we want a king. Why did they want a king? Why did the God's people, these are people that generations before had fought their way into the promised land. They had slain giants. They had conquered impossible odds. They had come through the wilderness and with Joshua. They had, they, had, they had taken dominion over the land of Israel. Just a short time later, the same people say, we want a king to rule over us. And why do we want? And God says, they're going to take you. God, God says, he's going to take your daughters. He's going to take your sons. He's going to take your money. He's going to take your land. You will be oppressed. And I, and I, I want to just quote this in 1 Samuel 8. Verse 17, he will take the tenth of your flocks and you shall be his slaves. They were freed from Egypt into the promised land. They're in the promised land and they want to be slaves again. And that day you'll cry out because you're king whom you have chosen for yourselves, but the Lord won't answer you in that day. And they said, no, verse 19, but there shall be a king over us so that we can be like all the nations and that our king may judge us and go out before us and fight our battles. You know why they wanted a king? Because they didn't want to fight anymore. And we want a king to go fight for us. So we'll be slaves if he'll fight for us. We'll be slaves if he does the work. We'll be a slave if he takes care of the problems. You know, I asked Ben, I said, you know, how can we, Ben Jenkins, our, you know, police officer in our church. Like, how can we solve the problem? He's like, if people just took care of their street, like if they saw something, they'd just take care of it. Instead of calling the police all the time, everything would change. So you know what? This alley, I take care of it. <laughs> Walk out the gate, man. There's a homeless. Hey, hey, buddy, guess what? You can't be here. There's kids here. I'm, I'm here to protect the kids. What do you think I'm going to do? I don't care, but you're not going to do it here. You can just walk on by. Want me to pray for you? No? Okay, keep going. If you don't go, I'm going to take your shopping cart, and I'm going to do something with it. They don't like when you mess with their shopping carts, man. They get serious. I don't know what's in there, but it means something. That he might fight our battles. What about you? Are you willing to fight on your knees and pray? Are you willing to read your word? Are you willing to tell somebody about Jesus? Or do you want somebody else to do it? You know, I was a little bummed out by all the people that left California to run away from the problems. They want a king to fight their battles for them. Let's vote for somebody to fight for us. Amen. We need to vote. But let's, let's be the embodiment of who we want to vote for. If not, we're just another person's slave. What are we going to choose? Slavery was their choice because their affections led them. That's not the way the church is. God doesn't want us to be, you know what? This church, it creeps in there. Serve me. But what are you going to, what are you going to give me tonight? What are you going to preach on, Pastor Josh? Uh, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'll catch you later. <laughs> You know, it's your turn now. Have you ever thought that before? Like, when's the next generation going to rise up so they can do the work? Somebody else go preach the gospel. Somebody else go to the mission field. Somebody else clean up the mess. You know, I love holding other people's babies. They're so cute. But when they get fussy, I love giving them back. <laughs> That's kind of how we are in the, in the kingdom of God, right? We love the blessing. We love the revival when the problem, hey, hey, take your baby back, man. But... We're enslaved. We're enslaved by our habits, by our time. You know, the Jesus said the problem isn't the harvest, the people, the city, the government. It's just that no one wants to work. See, freedom isn't free. It's actually more work than being a slave. Because now you have to think about it. A slave is just tell you what to do. You're being ruled by someone that's wicked and evil, and you're working on something that's fruitless. But once you get saved and you're set free, the work becomes profitable, and there's a destiny, and there's a purpose, and there's a harvest that's plentiful, but it requires a lot more work. Freedom is a risk. It takes courage. It takes work. 
Slavery is lazy, selfish, and fearful. How do we choose to see God? You know, our text for our, our, our harvesters is Matthew 25. It's interesting that, this, that, that all those servants, the one with five talents, the one with three talents, the one with one talent, they're all called bond servants, which is another word for slave. And the difference was is how they saw the master. Two of them saw him as a good master, and they were blessed, and they received much more. One of them saw him as a bad master, and he's like, okay, that's the way you see me. I'll show, I'll show you that side. Every stage, every season of our lives, there's new opportunities to choose. Every believer, you have a choice to walk in freedom and choose to work another day. I'm going to serve God. I'm going to put my hand to the plow. The harvest is plentiful. I'm going to be a laborer. Or we can choose to be enslaved. Who's going to do my job? Who's going to do it for me? I need some meat, I need some cucumbers, I need some onions and some... That sounds like a really good meal to me. What you crave is what you work for. Your master, your taskmaster, your pharaoh. When you no longer crave this world's desires, you're experiencing freedom. The power of choice. When you're free, you live according to your convictions rather than your affections. I'm going to say that again. When you're free, you live according to your convictions rather than your affections. When you do what you don't want to do or what's hard to do because it's the right thing to do, you're living free. Esther, she had freedom. Those were her robes that she wore to the king. She was the queen. She put on her crown. She could walk anywhere in the palace except for one place. And she used her freedom that day to walk before the king. She put on her crown. She walked before the king in her freedom to put herself and her life at risk, to plead on behalf of a nation of people. She stood on behalf of a hero. She used her freedom to sacrifice, to serve, to save. I think about the foremans who chose to go, who used their freedom to go preach the gospel in France, and now there's churches there. The Bowens who chose to go, who used their freedom to go, and now there's six churches there. If I understood that right, maybe there's even more. You know, my life has, there's two ways to see it. At school, there's a homeless guy in the alley that's harassing, you know, the gates or whatever it is, or camped out, out front. Hey, Pastor Josh, there's a homeless guy. Why is Pastor Josh the guy? If the volleyball team is discouraged, Josh, Josh, you need to cheer for them. Me? What about you? At school, there's a kid misbehaving. We need somebody to do it. Go send him to Pastor Josh. He'll bring the fear of God in them. I get home. The toilet is clogged. The fridge is broken. The lights are out. There's a spider. <laughs> Who's going to take out the trash? Who's going to do the dishes? I feel enslaved. But remember, I chose this. <laughs> All of it. I chose it. This is me. So there's two ways you can see your life. You are being ruled over, or as Pastor Steve, you have dominion. I asked for this. This is what I've always wanted. I want to be a hero that protects the kids. I want to be the team cheer, the seventh girl on the volleyball team. I want to be a part of the winning championships. I want to be someone that they say, if it wasn't for you, we could have never done it. I want to be that guy. I want to be there for my kids. I want to be there with the kids that are misbehaving, because just in case there's another Markel. Just in case there's another Pastor Steve. Amen. Just in case there's another Junior, who my dad says is his favorite son. <laughs> There might be another one out there. I want the problems. My freedom, I want to use for them. When I get home, there's spiders, there's toilets, there's trash, there's mess, because that means I have a beautiful wife. Hello? <laughs> and I get to be with her every single day. And I have awesome kids. I have a house that I get to plunge the toilet. <laughs> Praise the Lord. I'll punch it every single day in Jesus' name, amen. <laughs> every single day. I will kill a spider every day. I will take out the trash every day. And I will plunge the toilet every day because I am living my best life. <laughs> Hallelujah. 
I am not enslaved, I am free. So the testimony from our church, you know, there's, the, God's bringing revival in our church in Santa Monica. There's revival here. You know, we had this really hot day at school, and there was a problem because all the kids were sweating. And there's a couple of dads in the church and a couple of families were like, man, we need to do something about this. So what they did is that day they sent an email to all the parents. Anybody want to donate for ACs for the classroom? That day, all the money for air conditioned units for every single classroom in our school came in. That night, they came up with like nine AC units and they installed them all night long. In 24 hours, every classroom got an AC unit. Is that a miracle or what? I mean, it's, it's crazy to think about it. So in their quote, if I were to say you have to work 24 hours and you have to spend that kind of money, you would say you are a taskmaster. You are a pharaoh. You are a wicked slave driver. But in their freedom, they enslaved themselves. They worked harder in their freedom than anyone could ever make anybody work. But here's the question, how to be free? How bad do you want it? There was a kid in our school. He was foolish, and he got in trouble. And he was sitting in my office, and I was talking to him, and he was there, and I was asking him, like, you know what, um, do you want to get this right? And he said, um, yeah, I need to get this right. I, I was disobedient. I'm like, okay, well, how can we discipline you, and how can we, what's a, a proper discipline? And he's thinking about, well, I can do this, and I can do that, but... Didn't really, it wasn't really hard things, right? So I'm like, well, I think we probably should tell your dad. He folds his hands. <laughs> he looked at me. Well, I think that's probably taking it a little too far. <laughs> thank you, Lord. I just said, thank you, God, for blessing me today. That was the funniest thing I had ever seen. <laughs> I think we're taking this a little too far here. We don't really need to go that far, Pastor Josh. I'll do double homework. I'll do extra work. But, you know, that's the way we think, right? You know, it's like we want to really see breakthrough. We want to see freedom. But how bad do you want it? The Bible says take the yoke of Jesus, the bondservant of Jesus Christ. One time I was complaining to my wife. And I was like, man, this is so hard. It's so hard. And, I, and then she kind of looked at me. She's like, really? Really? She's like, you're a dad. That's who you are. Suck it up. That's what dads are supposed to be. Like, you know what? You're right. You're right. That's right. Let's do this. <laughs> Speak to me, honey. And I was thinking about it because, you know, a lot of times we think of ourselves as slaves. How bad do you want it? But also take on the yoke of Jesus. Why do we come to church? 1 Corinthians 9, for though I am free from all, I have made myself a bondservant to all, that I might win more of them. He says, although I'm free because God set me free from sin, now I am a slave to God that I can serve and I can serve everybody. I'm everybody's slave. Woo! <laughs> Jesus said, whoever would be great among you must be your servant. You want to see some power in your life, be the servant. Whoever will be first must be a slave of all. And I had this revelation that I probably should start serving people. Why is that funny? Jesus said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor, sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind to set at liberty those who are oppressed. The name of Jesus, Philippians 2.10, every knee should bow in heaven and earth and under the earth. Every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. We got to give people Jesus. And it's going to take some servants. It's going to take you and me saying, I'm the guy that's going to work. I'm the girl that's going to go tell somebody. There's somebody out there that needs God. And I want to look at, and finally, how do we become free? Because you're going to have to learn how to Sabbath. Let me ask you this Is there anything in your life that you would have a really hard time stopping? at any time. You know, in, in fitness, if you're carrying a weight and you can't stop in the motion, it's too heavy for you. You know, like people that carry weights. <laughs> can buff. Okay, stop. Whoa, boom, you know, you're going down, you know, it's too heavy. Can you stop anything? You're, 
You're enslaved if you can't stop it. Oh, I can stop it anytime. Okay, well, just try. Take a Sabbath. That's what fast means. Because Sabbath says, I'm done, God starts. I can't do it. This is when God takes over. That's why God had a Sabbath, because he says, I can do more in one day than you can do in six. You just need to keep remembering that, that no matter how hard you work, my grace is bigger than everything that you can do. No matter how big your problems, no matter how, I can do it all. God said, I can take my people out of, out of Egypt. I can break you free from slavery. I can take you across the wilderness where your flip-flops never wear out. I can take you into the promised land. I'm a God who sets you free. I have possessions for you. I can be your God. You will be my people. I have a destiny for your life. I have so much for you. Can you just stop and let me be God in your life? Let me be God. You know, freedom is the ability to say, no, God, it's in your hands. I'm not going to worry about this anymore. There's this lady, and I'm closing with this story. There's a lady named Biddy Mason. Biddy Mason was a, actually a slave. This is an 18, in the 1800s. Eight, she was born in 1818, and she was actually given away as a wedding gift. She was a slave um, to a southern slave master. His name was Robert Smith. And so Robert Smith moved to California with his slave, Biddy Mason, and, and the kids that they had or that you know, he had through her. And what happened was they came all the way to California and he, you know, they passed through Utah, some Mormon. He was not related to uh, Joseph Smith, but his last name was Smith. Turns out California had just made some anti-slavery laws. And so when they got there, they, you know, they found out that she was a slave and, and they started, you know, people started talking. So somebody was an advocate and went to the judge and said, this is not right. This lady should not be a slave and all of her kids and all this family. And so she couldn't testify in the court because at that time, the black people couldn't testify in court. And so the judge actually pulled her out of the court and said, tell me, do you want to be with this guy or not? And she said, she said no. So he went back into the court and he said, she's no longer yours. And so Robert Smith lost his slaves and he went to Texas and Biddy Mason stayed there with her kids, flat broke. This is where the story begins. She worked as a nurse and a midwife here in LA. And she began to make some money. She actually got a, uh, a degree. And it turns out that uh, her, her degree, she was making like two fifty dollars a day. And apparently that was big money back then. But she saved up $300,000, which would be the equivalent of like more than $6 million today. And she bought most of downtown LA. She owned most of downtown LA. She bought most of downtown, and she began to give to charities, the homeless and the sick. She, she started an elementary school. She was the founding member of the first African Methodist Episcopal Church of Los Angeles, the church, this city's first black church, and it was built on her land. She was a slave, but when she got set free, oh my goodness, she took over. She owned L.A., yeah. And her children became some of the most wealthy kids in, like, the United States. She has a quote. She said, if you hold your hand closed, nothing good can come in. The open hand is blessed, for it gives in abundance, even it, as it receives. There's a park for her in L.A. Her name is Biddy Mason. What about you tonight? What's holding you back from Jesus? Why can't God speak into your life? Why are you not hearing from God? What is holding you enslaved? Is it a thought? Is it bitterness? Is it unforgiveness? Is it a habit? Is it a distraction? Is it at your notifications? Because God's talking and you can be free. And Christian, you can live free. Let's bow our heads as we close. Thank you so much for your patience.